again, everybody. It's Michael from Fujifilm. And in this workbench, we're going to talk about how to take your typical mirrorless camera and build it for a cinema-ready operation. Uh, this is not specific to Fujifilm cameras. This will work for whatever brand of camera you may also happen to have at home and want to try movie making. So many of you out there are getting more and more interested in doing movie making for real, uh, getting serious projects done, but you're probably intimidated by the incredible assortment of hardware that's out there. And maybe you don't know whether you need this stuff or how do you use all this stuff. Well, I'm going to show you. Uh, recently, in the last few months, I was the director of photography on a feature film that was, had an extremely low budget, and it was shot in all of five days, but it's an hour and 40 minutes long. And one of the keys to making that work was to keep things simple and make things flexible and be able to adapt to a variety of situations in a small, confined space. This kind of thing is one of the ways to get there. So first of all, let me make this very clear. You don't need any of this stuff at all just to make a movie, okay? You need a camera, you need a lens, you need some actors, all right? And more importantly, you need a good script. Before you even try to shoot anything, please, please, please write yourself a good story, <clears throat> write a good script, get some good actors. After that, all you need is a lens and a camera and just go out there and make a movie. Okay. Now, the reason we have this kind of stuff is to make that process more professional, make it feel better, and make it easier for me, the operator, to deal with how uh, the actors move and changing light setups and just getting everything the best quality. Okay, so this is an X-T3, not an X-T4. I'll tell you why in a minute. And this is an MKX 18 to 55 T 2.9 cinema lens. Okay, so the XT3, I'm able to record uh, F log, HLG, uh, different flavors of compressed RAW, uh, all via the HDMI output. Uh, or internally to the SD card. And the MKX series of lenses are built specifically for cinema operation and they're all purely, purely manual operation. Uh, I explained the difference between a cinema lens and a regular camera lens in an earlier workbench video. So please go look that up. Now, the camera is sitting inside a metal cage. There are many manufacturers that make these cages, and these cages run anywhere from about $75 up to a couple of hundred, depending on the manufacturer. I will say, uh, be careful of the ones that are labeled as universal cages. They literally will hold pretty much any camera that's made. <clears throat> the problem with that is they tend to be really, really large because they need to be able to hold any camera that's made. I would suggest you stay away from those and instead get one that's actually purposely designed for the exact model of camera you have, or at least is designed for the family of cameras that you may own, okay? And as you can see, this one is very, very tight fitting and, and uh, it's got cutouts for all the knobs and the controls for this particular Fujifilm camera. And if you have a different brand, yours would have cutouts and holes for uh, accessing the controls <clears throat> on your style of camera. But what's great about these cages is A, they give you protection for the body in case you drop it. But B, there's also different cold shoe mounts and lots of uh, quarter 20 screw threaded holes in here that I can attach things to. So as you can see, I have two articulated arms mounted to the top here. One is to hold a monitor recorder. This is a five inch one, and it has a nice bright large LCD screen that either I can use for operation or the director can use to view the scene while I'm using the camera LCD, or I can turn this off to the side so I can operate this way and I can have somebody operating the focus off to the left of the camera by turning this. 
Also, with a separate articulated arm, I could mount, say, a wireless uh, video transmitter. We did this a lot. That would send the video signal out from the recorder by way of a wireless radio uh, operation to a remote monitor sitting in something called Video Village, where the director and the producer could watch everything without actually being on, uh, on the set. Um, or if I wasn't recording sound to a dedicated second sound system on this particular movie that I did, we had a sound recorder that was recording on a, something that he wore on his belt. If I wanted to record the sound internally to the camera, which I do a lot, then I would put an adapter up here so I could connect microphones to this adapter and adjust the amplitude uh, of the signal on that adapter before sending it to the microphone jack on the side of the camera. Uh, so that is why it's really nice to have these uh, threaded holes on the cages. And the cages, enable, the cages enable you to do that without putting stress on the camera hot shoe. Your camera hot shoe was not designed to take a lot of abuse. It was designed to hold a flash. Okay, so uh, it's a much better idea if you're going to be uh, putting a lot of accessories on your camera to have a cage. Now, something else about the cage, and, and not all of these have them, but this particular one and the other one I'm going to show you in a few minutes, have a base plate that connects to a tripod. And in between the camera and the tripod are, is a, a rod adapter. And you can see these shiny chrome rods here at the bottom. These happen to be 15 millimeters in diameter. They're very strong and rigid, and they allow me to add extra doodads underneath the camera, such as hanging this big battery on the back, or underneath the lens, you'll see there is this support that's clamped on here that holds the lens from underneath to take strain off the mount of the camera. And also, there is this handy knob on the side that's called a follow focus. Now, the follow focus engages with these gears, these teeth that are on the side of the cinema lens. You'll notice there's one for focus, one for zoom, and one for iris. So, follow focus was designed to be able to let uh, an operator for the focus alone to stand off to the side while I'm framing up and following the actors, I can have somebody else that's uh, dealing with the focus only, so I don't have to think about two things at once. But if you are a one-person camera operator, also having it this way is a little more ergonomically friendly than having to turn the lens barrel uh, along the axis of the lens. So that's what follow focus is for. Now, these gears also uh, allow you to attach motors to by way of the rails uh, to these gears. So I could have a remote control motor for the zoom. I could have a remote control motor for the iris, which is why we want to have a nice big battery. Now, uh, this battery happens to be 190 watt hours. Now this kind of a brick puts out 14 volts of power. So um, this battery is attached to an adapter plate and the adapter plate then is what allows me to connect this whole thing to the rods. And the nice thing is by putting it on the back of the camera, this helps counterbalance my lens. So um, First of all, you should always, always have a tripod, a good, decent video tripod. Um, in, if you look at movie making, almost never, or in fact probably never, will you do an entire movie that's handheld. Uh, the shaky camera thing, as popular as it is, and as much as many people like it, starts to drive you crazy after a while. And even in war movies, you'll see, for the most part, handheld camera operation is only for particular moments where they want to heighten the, excite the excitement. But smooth and steady operation is the key in movie making. And if you look with this, with the pan operation, it's real, real easy for me just with one hand to be able to get smooth, ro smooth rotation on this camera. Secondly, I can get really good tilts up and down. Again, very, very simple, almost with one finger when everything is properly balanced. And having the battery on the back is part of that. 
But by having this big battery, and if you look on the side here, there are multiple ports that, that come out of this adapter plate. So I can power the camera from one of these ports. I can power the recorder from one of these ports. I can power that radio transmitter. I can power any kind of additional motors all from these multiple ports. That's what makes these really good. Now I can tell you this particular battery, the camera alone, it will power this, ca this camera for about eight hours nonstop. With the monitor turned on, I get about five or six hours, and that's nonstop operation without shutting anything down at all. Now remember I said it's 14 volts output, so what you're going to need to do is get some kind of an adapter for your camera. Uh, this has a dummy battery on it, and this goes underneath the, uh, into the battery compartment of the camera, and then there's a power regulator in the middle, and then there's this plug in the end that is called a P-tap or D-tap, so power tap or D-tap. And that is the plug that is universal among all these different batteries and adapter plates that let you connect all kinds of devices to them. Now, one other thing that you might want um, is uh, an adapter ring that I'm going to show you on my other camera to be able to enable follow focus to work with your regular still camera lenses. All right, so this was, like I said, our A camera setup. It never left the tripod, but we did have a second camera and sometimes a third, and those were more mobile. So let me get this out of the way, and I'm going to show you how those were set up. Join me for the next episode to show you how to build something that's configurable to go from tripod to handheld. See you next time.